All right, Tim, we're back. Last week we talked fat loss. This week we're going to swing it the other way and talk about muscle gain. So what is super critical that we need to get get correct right up front for muscle gain? One of the things I want to open with is with weight loss or fat loss, how psychological that was. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about this. I really think that muscle gain or hypertrophy is more physiology. And right. what I mean by that is the motivation is going to be there. I've yet to meet a person that wants to gain muscle that doesn't lose momentum at the slightest hiccup, right? That, I just, I don't find there's as many like speed bumps. If we're looking at this from when I work with clients and, you know, getting to point B, mostly it's just the raw mechanisms to gain muscle and weight in general, like being at a caloric surplus and, and strength training a certain amount per week. And then within that strength training session, having a certain amount of density, meaning we have probably more work than we do rest. And then that work is foundation. Uh, the foundation's built upon tension and having some sort of load and then contraction of a shortening, lengthening, stoppage in between that shortening or lengthening and shortening and that contractile part of the the muscle is is tensing and when we aggregate that out it's okay hey you want to gain muscle here's the the raw material we need to eat more we need to focus on a lot more protein we need to strength train minimum of four or five days a week and then we need to look at you need to be under tension two thirds of a 60 minute session. And that could be, we're going to do 20 sets of eight to 12 reps with a four second eccentric, no pause in the contracted position, explosive concentric, no pause in the rested position. So when we break down that session, the majority of the time you're going to be under tension and you're going to either break down muscle fiber and that's going to respond by building up, or you're going to get this metabolic stress, which creates this swelling effect, and that creates a downstream effect of building that tissue up through our endocrine system and our immune system and even our cardiovascular system from the dynamic that, okay, like all of this is a lot simpler to focus on just the physiology. Because when we get to that, oh man, I had a bad weekend. Look at all the examples of people who just really look at building muscle. How many people on Monday in a traditional box gym or getting in there, regardless of what they did on the weekend, who want to build muscle. And I would not necessarily say that's the same pattern when we come up to a weekend of travel or just maybe you went out a lot or maybe you just got off your rhythm when you're trying to lose weight. And that process of dialing into your why for losing weight versus building muscle it's like you know what you need to do you just got to stop and do it so i think we could pull a different motivational tactic of more assertiveness and and accountability uh it's not so uh detrimental when they have a speed bump but that's why i would say we could focus a lot more on the physiology aspect as opposed to the psychological aspect so i mean we got to be got to have a lot of tension so that's slowing things down on the eccentric and just being really consistent getting in there five four or five days a week mm -hmm. what about quote unquote hard gainers what are what's your take on hard gainers yeah so we, we talked a little bit about last time ectomorphs endomorphs mesomorphs like the mesomorphs are going to be the short squatty guys and they're going to have a higher predisposition to putting on muscle versus the ectomorph or the hard gainers, the tall, skinny, or the short, skinny, doesn't matter, just skinny. One with not as much either predisposition to putting on muscle. And yeah, you could argue that you probably need that psychological input, like the, the endomorph trying to lose weight versus the ectomorph trying to gain weight. They probably still really struggle with consistency and compliance. But the one thing that I find that's a lot easier is, one, it's easier to eat more than it is to eat less. It's a lot more of a definitive view of yourself when your shirts feel, fit differently when you're adding muscle. I find it's a lot less a lot less friction when someone's like, oh man, I'm trying to lose 100 pounds and you lose a, only lose a pound, there's still progress, versus that person that's trying to gain weight, gained a half a pound, doesn't view it in the same light. You know, that it might have not necessarily been as much progress 
but they view it in a much more positive way. But with the ecto, I, the the same component, I just think you need to amplify, right? You need to look at it from whatever we're doing from a surplus, right? It might mean more calories in, relatively speaking to your body mass. It might mean a greater focus on certain things that are going to produce more of a endocrine or hormonal response, right? Specifically insulin, that the most potent anabolic hormone in the body that we can produce naturally is going to be insulin, that you don't need a whole lot more than someone who's really, really skinny than insulin. Like that's going to be the foundational piece of, okay, I'm going to pump you full of a lot of high glycemic carbs and you're going to shuttle a lot of glucose into that muscle because when we look at building muscle, really muscle is a store, muscles for contractile stuff. And, but we know that there's a lot of passive energy transfer when we run or jump, like the connective tissues create a lot of passive movement, right? We don't necessarily have to have all this mechanical work. And we see this with really robust athletes that are super efficient. Their expenditure from contractile energy output of just contracting the muscle tissue is a lot less than someone who's really elastic and can produce a lot of energy transfer passively. But the dynamic with a skinny person is we're going to do this active energy, right? We're going to contract tissues, we're going to create tension. And what that does is creates greater storage for glycogen, which is a storage form of carbohydrate. And the more I create this tension, the more the need to store more glycogen because the body perceives that it's going to do more of this mechanical energy. And I break down the tissue for a functional reason because I need to be better response to that stress when it comes again, right? So I bench, stress the pecs, the pec fibers break and rupture, and they respond by getting stronger and adding more contractile tissue. They increase in size. They start to create more sarcomeres or contractile units of length, and we're more muscle the next time. So when I incur that same stress, I'm more prepared, right? Now the body says, okay, this is going to be something that we're going to do and we better be ready for it. And that's the late onset muscle soreness. It's the recovery process, like a caterpillar going to a cocoon to become a butterfly to respond better to that stress the next time. But the real aspect, it's more storage for carbohydrates. So we have more energy to do this mechanical work later. And if we think about it from, if I have high glycemic carbs, like sugars that break down quickly, I bump up my insulin for my pancreas, that insulin pumps out, that pumps that glucose into the muscle cell to store for later. And the more glycogen you therefore have is a direct, re, a direct response and correlation to more muscle you have. And, you know, the other part, which is always funny, and this is like we always talk about in the Army, we have a large meta-analysis on how to gain weight, you know, just be sedentary and be in a surplus, right? We know that when we are in a surplus and we're in sedentary, that we'll gain weight. Now, the difference is we want this to be more functional mass, i.e. contractile tissue. So we're just going to sub out being sedentary with strength training for the, for the ability to build muscle because we want this to be more aesthetic. We want this to be more functional. We want to be more capable. We can see this throughout the whole range of athletics, but we also see it with just gen pop, you know, the building of muscle is foundational. And then now there's a renaissance, right? There's a, a huge, huge paradigm shift back to strength training. And it's cool. We've been on this way for a long time. We've been riding hard, right? So that that element of, okay, we have some more people more interested in weight training than they ever have. There's less stigmatism associated with it. There's less body images of, of lifting weights going to make you look like a freak or a monster. It's going to be, you're going to look healthy and athletic and more, more capable, right? In a, in a, a zombie apocalypse, you're going to be one of the last to get eaten kind of thing. And when we look at now strength training and understanding the real mechanism it's, yeah, it might have a functional output of being able to do ADLs or activities of daily living or be more capable in your sport. But there's also the adage of you want to see this manifest into something physical and you want your shirts to fit better. You want your pants to fit better. You want to feel confident when you're in front of the mirror. Like there's that, like no one's doing just strength training for altruistic, like functional reasons, right? You're not like lumberjacks. You're, you want to look good. And when you have an ectomorph or someone is a hard gainer, 
And we start saying, okay, well, like, it's pretty easy. Like you have to just get leverage your insulin sensitivity because you're going to be more prone to accepting insulin because your muscle cells are, are more contingent upon that. You have less fat cells to accept, accept that insulin. Okay, that's going to be a net positive, but you have to build it around strength training and the windows of availability, not just sucking down high glycemic carbs just to do it, but it's trying to get carbohydrates timed correctly. And then the other component would be having just plenty of amino acids circulating, right? So the protein breaks down to a peptide, breaks down to amino acid that absorbs into our bloodstream. We have that circulating and available that goes into what we call the amino acid pool. And the amino acid pool is like gas, a gas tank in your car. The more you drive, the less amino acids you have. So we deplete that quickly. So we need to constantly eat protein. And when we look at someone who needs to gain weight, who has a hard time with it, it's just building, building in these loops of, okay, strength training, high glycemic carbs, lots of protein. Okay, when are we getting our nose protein feeding? What are we having for carbohydrates around that? A little lower glycemic, so maybe some white rice, some, some starchy tubers like potatoes, sweet potatoes, yams. Okay, we're, we're just constantly in the cycle. And when we're thinking about that person that's struggling to get momentum, you're just looking at the worst part of their day and saying, okay, well, how do we manage that part? And how do we get them to commit to staying on track? Because when they get past that worst part of their day hurdle, they're going to be able to blow through whatever limiting factor there. And I get to the raw mechanisms of strength train, be in a surplus, do that consistently. Kind of hit on it a little bit with, you know, amino acids, eating enough protein, but how, and, you know, the high glycemic carbohydrates, how, how should our nutrition, what should our nutrition look like from a muscle gain standpoint versus a fat loss standpoint? Because it's yeah. not going to be the same, right? Yeah, no, it's not. Okay. So disclaimer here, no one has any idea how you're going to respond to any intervention, right? Yep. And, and it's all contingent upon, we're not. We're not working in a vacuum. We don't have a controlled study. So you're not in a lab and we're just pumping you through of like nutritional goop and you just suck it down. Like you have free will to make good or bad choices and you have free will to tell me the truth or not tell me the truth, right? It's completely up to you. Now, with that being said, is we're going to start at what I call like the median, right? We're going to be like, this is where majority of the people will gain weight. This is where majority of the people will lose weight. And caloric wise, 16, 18 times your body weight is usually a good target if you want to gain weight, if you're strength training three to four days a week. So you just take your body weight. Let's say I weigh hundred pounds and I want to gain weight. Just multiply that by 16, 18. We should be upwards to 1800 calories. Now you'd argue is out too little. And you've seen maybe some calories at 4,000, 5,000 for extreme ectomorphs. Yes, potentially. But we should at least rule out if 1800 is enough, right? If I can, because there's a huge, huge one financial cost and then two huge interruption to their life. You know, that's the part as like practitioners, we often lose sight of, of like, we just hand you, and people ask me for nutrition plans. Like the nutrition plans completely like, like obsolete if this is too much too soon. Right. Hey, you're going to be willing to weigh your foods. Are you going to eat pretty much 30 to 40 grams of protein three to, or six times a day? Are you going to walk around with Tupperwares and a jug of water no matter what? Like there's like a certain level of tolerable change that people can accept. And we need to be aware of that and conscious of that. But in the other note of this, when we look at that median, right? Like I just want to figure out if 18, 16, 18 is too much or too little calories versus if you want to lose weight again. 12 to 14, that's the median. It might not be enough of a caloric drop, but I can start there and I can go, okay, well, at least now I know, and I can go less calories, but I need to have some sort of start point. So we're looking at that middle of the road of like 12 to 14 times your body weight if you need to lose weight, 16 to 18. And I'm trying to tease out whether you can be compliant at that caloric intake, right? Like if I'm telling someone who needs to gain a gross amount of weight, that they need to increase their calories by, let's just say 5%, and they're unwilling to do that. Imagine if it was 25%, they almost added a quarter of the calories they're eating on a daily basis to their day. Their chances of them not being compliant with that is even more so. In fact, it might actually make a reverse effect where they actually end up eating less because it was too much. Like they just say, screw it, there's no way I'm gonna make that goal, so what's the point? 
you basically put them in a position to fail. And what I would argue is you start with something that you know they can be successful with and prove to me that you can do it. Like smoke this, like, wow, you showed me, like you really proved to me that I grossly underestimated your commitment here. Like, thank God that I now know that. Now we can raise the ante, but we go off a foundation of knowing that. And then we look at the other end of the spectrum, how those calories are broken up. Those calories are just energy in the form of heat, right? That's how we look at it. It goes in the body. It starts to break down, it creates heat, that creates energy. But those individual molecules have different structures, right? So we look at it from there's protein, carbs, and fat. And all of them are essential, right? The idea of non-essential versus essential gets into this conversation of if you don't need to eat it, that means it's non-essential. The other end of it, if you do need to eat it, it's essential, no matter what your pretense is right? All macronutrients are essential, just depending on how essential. That varies based off your goal, based off of the day, based off your time of year, based off of seasonality, based off a lot of things. When we look at carbs, fat, and protein, we could just very simply look at a carbs or energy. Protein is building and fat is kind of the, the, the lubrication of the system, so to speak. And, you know, the transfer of fat-soluble vitamins, looking at cell wall structure, looking at all sorts of things like to say that fat is non-essential or carbohydrates are non-essential, like huge misconception. And that part to me becomes more of an opportunity to teach as opposed to go on this crusade of this diet they saw on social media with a outcome measure that looks really good is superior in any way, right? You're associating causation correlation, right? And not knowing any other variables from genetics and maybe pharmaceuticals. But the notion that we villainize a certain macronutrient or food group is a huge mistake because you're putting people in disadvantage, disadvantage of now having to figure out solutions with something they're more accustomed to in their life and they don't know what to do. So when you get in that conversation of like, okay, from the top, top of the list, you're going to be in a caloric surplus by being 16, 18, and we'll do that until we know it's either too much or too little. And then we're going to be in a deficit by being 12 to 14. And we'll do that again until we know it's too much or too little. And we see this by tracking over time. And then we break up those in terms of carbs, fats, and protein, depending on what we want to do from that hormonal response and what we think you're going to respond to. So simply is if I want to gain weight, I'm going to basically get this lever leaning harder towards carbohydrates over fat. If I wanted to lose weight, I'm going to turn that lever and move it more towards fat than carbohydrate. And the rationale behind that is just capitalizing on that insulin roller coaster, right? That that person that's overweight, that has a high body fat, has a hard time managing that insulin load and responds poorly. So fat will slow down gastric emptying, meaning that we're digesting slower, as well as it has a, a reduction in insulin production, right? That we know that when we eat more fat, we produce less insulin. We actually produce more glucagon, which is the counter hormone to insulin. Now, on the other end of it, I just reverse it, right? I want to deplete glucagon, which is going to be this thing that breaks down food, right? Or breaks down energy in our body, breaks down tissues, right? It's called this gluconeogenic pathway. How do we create glucose and ATP from non-glucose and glycogen? Well, it comes from fat. Maybe it comes from muscle tissue. But either way, glucagon is going to be the thing that stimulates that. And that comes from another hormone called leptin, which is our satiety hormone. So if the body feels like it's starving, it's going to activate glucagon. We're going to find energy somewhere. And a lot of times when we get into this dynamic of, of looking at leptin and this satiety hormone, and we are constantly eating high glycemic foods, that we have blood sugars violently going up and then dropping because insulin's shuttling that into adipose cells and muscle cells and organs for that matter, that our bodies always proceed to be hungry because our, our body's energy regulator is all off kilter. This is what they call leptin resistance. But when we start to think about the other end of it, they're probably very leptin sensitive. They're probably very insulin sensitive. Like if I want to gain weight, I want to capitalize on the things that we know will help make people gain weight, right? And it's just being conscious of, look, okay, this is a necessary step to reverse whatever they were doing for a period of time and then put them in that direction, whatever that put that weight, wet weight gain person in a period of time. And it's, it's, it might, it's just so simple. It just might be true kind of thing. But like, think about what you did and reverse it. 
right? Almost like do the opposite direction. And you can argue, well, usually ectos are pretty much eating candy all day. Well, they're not eating enough candy and they're not timing it well. And they're not doing that enough over a period of time. And that's where you as a coach is try to work through and troubleshoot. Okay, them. And then the other end of it is protein. And protein is going to be universal, like gram per pound, right? If you're strength training, you should be getting a gram per pound and finding solutions to get that. Because it's just so net positive, right? We're, we're looking at it for amino acid pool. We look at the, if I want to lose weight, okay, well, there's going to be a higher thermic effect of eating that, meaning it costs more energy to break that down has a higher satiating effect which is this ghrelin hormone so our body responds to how full we fe feel by stimulating ghrelin and ghrelin will circulate our body or circulate to our brain saying you're full don't need it anymore you don't need it anymore and usually when we eat very quickly digesting foods like just simple sugars ghrelin doesn't activate and that's where fat and protein comes in it's going to stimulate a lot of ghrelin we're going to feel full faster and then leptin Leptin becomes more of this thing that regulates our hunger and our feeling of energy and performance. On the other end of it, though, like, all right, like you just trained. You have a lot of insulin sensitivity. You have a lot of broken down tissue. We need to stimulate glycogen replenishment and building up those tissues by really, really cascading a lot of insulin. And that comes from high glycemic carbs. We also need to have an amino acid pool. So the simple way to think about this is surplus, start 16 to 18 times your body weight. Deficit, okay, if you want to lose weight, think 12 to 14 times your body weight. In terms of protein, it's universal, one gram per pound, regardless of weight gain, weight loss. And then we're just going to move the needle into more towards carb if we want to gain weight and more towards fat and less carb if we want to lose weight. Wow, you read my mind. I was just about to ask about protein and mm. clarify that we're titrating carbs and fat. So thank you for that. Just making my life easy over here. As far as like, let's say I'm tracking, I'm in that 16 to 18. I've been tracking how long, like I'm tracking my food. I'm weighing my food out all that. All, I'm doing everything right, so to speak. I'm doing all the right things, but I'm still not seeing progress. But how long uh, should I be tracking until I start making my next change? So you can make very intuitive decisions about eating. Mm -hmm. Like the, I should be able to go to Chipotle and calculate, okay, that's 40 grams of protein, 80 grams of carbs, 20 grams of fat, like that. Like I should be able to do that, right? Like when you talk to any bodybuilder who still weighs their food, it's mostly the habit and the accountability. Yeah. They're not doing it because they, they don't know how many grams of carbs, fats, and protein in there. It's mm -hmm. automatic. They just do it to hold themselves accountable, to keep that feedback loop of everything you eat matters, right? You, you know, I think that part is... You basically just condition yourself to go, okay, like everything I put in my body is weighed and calculated. But they know. So if I'm, sorry, not, not to interrupt. Ahead, so if ahead. I'm not seeing progress, it's do I, should I add more carbs first? So I think you should understand like what more carbs. Lever, right? I think you should more understand how many carbs you're eating. Okay. Right? Because the truth is, is if you don't have a foundation of knowing how many carbs you're eating and then you have some sort of, some sort of average, right? You're eating let's just say 400 grams of carbs a day if you want to gain weight, right? That's just a number. Mm -hmm. And then you start to do that over a couple of weeks and you look at it from I'm averaging 400 grams of carbs a day. Some days it was 450, some days it was 350. Then you can definitively say if that's not enough or, or enough. And from there you titrate up or titrate down, but it's off the foundation of, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of times we just start to say, okay, well, do I need to eat more carbs? Like relative to what? Right. Like I've seen plenty of people gain muscle from not eating enough carbs because mm -hmm. it just works that way. Right. And what I would argue is there's a median for you that we need to understand what creates an outcome, not a median for overall, right? Remember, we're complex, open, adaptive systems, meaning we get energy from the outside world. So there's not almost a set feedback loop regardless, right? We could probably figure out the impact of chlorophyll in a plant and procuring energy from sunlight, we don't necessarily have the same working knowledge with looking at it with a human. Mm -hmm. And there's a multivariate con a convergence of all these variables from how long you've been at a certain body mass, body composition, how much muscle mass you have, your age, your overall endocrine system, your immune system, your cardiovascular system, your digestive system, all of that is converging into how a, a single molecule of energy metabolizes and becomes something in your body that's going to be different for everyone so what we need to find out is what's enough too little or too much for you 
for calories, carbs, fats, and protein. And then from there, we start to go, okay, well, what are you averaging a day? And are we making weight gain? I'm averaging 400 grams of carbs a day, which is 800 calories. I'm sorry, that's more than that, 1600 calories, 1600 calories. And that's, I'm not gaining weight. Then therefore it's not enough. Now we know that and we could build up off that. Let's bump up to 450 and let's see what the impact of that is. And then we build. And I think that's the part that often gets lost in tracking. It's, it just gives you some sort of foundational knowledge of, of what's enough or too little. And oftentimes we start to associate the, well, I'm not making enough progress. Well, it could be a problem of consistency, right? And I think that's easily misunderstood, you know? And I think it's a lot of like, you throw in something to the mix of fasting, like a, a niche thing that's powerful in itself. It's a great modality. But when we think about it from the people that need to gain weight, it's harder to cram more food that's going to put you in a surplus in a smaller window of time. So very impractical solution. But we throw that in there often and we don't disassociate with the fact that I'm just can't eat as much in these smaller windows of time. And then go, well, I, I, I'm not eating enough carbs. Like, right. Well, look, you got a four hour window, which you can eat. So unless you're basically just drinking it through a straw, you're probably not going to eat enough carbs. And, and that process too is like the, I think good ones. And this is what you'll see with anyone that's extremely experienced in their life or, or that like they can, like doctors or surgeons that can diagnose based off of like just looking at it, right? They just know instinctually. Like, I think a good strength coach, someone who's really savvy about putting on muscle, can just look at that person and go, okay, they're probably doing too much energy expenditure, or they're not, they're not capitalizing on these windows of opportunities the way they should, right? They don't have a great morning routine, right? Like, oh, I don't like to eat breakfast in the morning. Like, that's where I'm leaning in on. Like, as soon as they start telling me they don't like to do something, I'm trying to figure out solutions to fit, solve that problem because that's going to be the bottleneck. That's where all results will stop if I don't figure out solutions to that problem that they're telling me. And they already, already know what their limiting factor is. So they're almost imploring you to go, help me get over this hurdle. And that's where I think your job is as a practitioner. So really it boils down to being consistent, tracking, you're, you're running your own science experiment on yourself, essentially. And how bad do you want it? Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that often part of there's always going to be that moment where you are tired and don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. That's the part that makes a difference. Really, yep. you know, bottom line, you know, <laughs> like, you know, that's why the people who have and the people that don't and, yep. and it's not really complicated. It's just, it's hard. Yeah. You gotta do it. Yeah. So awesome, man. Well, this is fun. Yeah, this is great, Tim. Thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. Later.